On this day of worship, we then turn our attention to the word of our God. We are experiencing the second Sunday of Advent. Please note our first lesson will be our Old Testament lesson. That Old Testament lesson is found recorded for us in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 10. Do note these words are really a prophecy about Jesus, what Jesus will do for us, not only when he comes the first time, but also what he would do for us the second time. That's where the lion will eat the straw and, and, and that things like that. That's the second coming of Jesus when uh, this heaven and earth will be purged of all its sin and we will live in glory and marvel with God forever. Isaiah 11. A shoot will spring up from the stump of Jesse and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. He will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes, nor will he render decisions based on what his ears hear. But with righteousness he will judge the poor, and he will render fair decisions in favor of the humble of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will kill the wicked. Righteousness will be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his hips. The wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze. Their young ones will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the cattle. The nursing child will play near a cobra's hole, and the wean child will put his hand on the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. It will happen in that day that the peoples will seek the root of Jesse, who will be standing like a banner for the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. Here ends our lesson. Our next lesson is our epistle lesson. That epistle lesson is found recorded for us in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 15, verses 4 through 13. We are reminded that God's word is, of course, given for our instruction so that we grasp the wonder and the marvel of what our God has prepared and done for us in Jesus. Indeed, whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction so that through the patient endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we would have hope. And may God, the source of patient endurance and encouragement, grant to you, that you agree with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that with one mind, in one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For this reason, accept one another as Christ also accepted you to the glory of God. For I am saying that Christ became a servant of those who are circumcised for the sake of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs. He also did this so that the Gentiles would glorify God for his mercy as it is written, for this reason I will praise you among the Gentiles, and I will sing to your name. And again it says, rejoice you Gentiles with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples give him praise. And again, Isaiah says, there will be a root of Jesse, and he is the one who will raise up to rule the Gentiles. On him the Gentiles will place their hope. Now may the God of hope fill you with complete joy and peace as you continue to believe so that you overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Here ends our lesson. Hallelujah. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight, and everyone will see the salvation of God. Hallelujah. Please rise for the gospel. Our gospel lesson is recorded for us in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Do note, these words will serve as the basis for our sermon. In those days, John the Baptist appeared, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, because the kingdom of heaven is near. Yes, this is he of whom this was spoken through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all of Judea, and all the region around the Jordan were going out to him. 
They were baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for his baptism, he said to them, You offspring of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Do not think of saying to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God is able to raise up children for, from, for Abraham from these stones. Already the axe is ready to strike the root of the trees. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but the one who comes after me is mightier than I. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing shovel is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Here ends our gospel lesson. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of our God that we turn our attention to this evening is found recorded for us in Matthew chapter 3. Let me highlight for you at this point just verse 3. Yes, this is he of whom this was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Here ends our lesson. Let's you and I continue with prayer. Well, thank you, dear Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to gather together to give you worship and praise and glory and honor. Thank you for the opportunity to sit down and comprehend and contemplate your holy word and, and what it says to us. May we hear the marvel of Jesus. May we grasp salvation by grace. May we all the more be your children. In his name we pray. Amen. So honestly, I... I, I don't think you could ever do an Advent series and not make reference to John the Baptist and his unique role. You know, he played a unique role in the coming of Jesus. Now remember, though John is responsible for preparing people for the first coming of Jesus, it's very evident that as John is doing his work, it's very evident that he thoroughly understands the eternal implications of Jesus' coming, meaning that John also ends up preparing souls for the second coming of Jesus. It really is such a fascinating man with a, with a unique role to play in the unveiling of the plan of God for the salvation of the world. Our theme for today will be prepare the way of the Lord. If you would, let you and I begin our discussion of John's work by taking a closer look at John himself. It's, uh, you know, in looking closer at John's life, we can see how he becomes all the more a, a successful preacher, how he managed to draw literally thousands of people into the wilderness to hear him. I mean, you really didn't think it was John's clothing and John's diet that attracted people, did you? No, it, it, it was his preaching. It was what he said and how he said what he said that brought people out to him. And yet, at the same time, it's John's preaching that will eventually lead him into great trouble. And you can rightly say that John's preaching cost him his head. Please recall that we know who John's mother and father are. His mother's name is Elizabeth. She was some sort of relative to Mary, the mother of Jesus. His father's name was Zechariah. Zechariah was a member of the priestly division of Abijah. And the most important thing in this is to remember that John would have been of priestly descent. That means that in his childhood, John was being prepared to do exactly what his father did to serve in the temple, to serve as a priest of the Old Testament. Yes, John was preparing to serve the Lord. But somewhere along the line, somewhere along the line, John was motivated and moved by the Holy Spirit to leave that role and to take on the specific role of forerunner for the Christ that God had prepared for him. What all of that means is that John knew, and he knew very well, the priestly rulers, the authorities, and the leadership of the Jewish people. 
Because you see, he had been raised with them. He went to school with them. He had been schooled in all the finer points of the Jewish priesthood in the same manner that Annas and Caiaphas and all the other priestly rulers of Jesus' day had. But one thing distinguished John. That one thing, by the way, is mentioned in the Gospel of Luke. And that one thing is told to Zechariah by the angel who announced John's birth. That angel clearly reveals he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. He will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. He will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn hearts of the fathers to the children, to turn the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to prepare a people who are ready for the Lord. It's those words that I believe tell us how John ended up in the wilderness preaching. You see, John was filled with the Holy Spirit. John understood the truth and the wonder of God's holy and revealed word. And I can only imagine the challenge that John presented to his priestly instructors. You know, to those who were trying to make the ministry of the temple a work righteous thing, or to those who ignored the reality of sin and damnation and instead kind of proclaimed a, a wimpy, don't worry about him, God, because after all, you are the Jewish people. John would have grasped the truth of the sacrifices and of the law. John would have understood the salvation that God was planning through the Savior who was to come, uh, the Savior who was foreshadowed in everything the priests of the temple were doing, but for the last 400 years, which the priests had been ignoring, John knew firsthand about the false teaching, about the hypocrisy, and about the factual unbelief of his fellow priests. He had lived with them. He had trained with them. And when the time was right, the Holy Spirit moved John to the wilderness. And there, there, in spectacular fashion, John began his message of sin and repentance, a message that was preparing hearts for the Lord. And yep, yep, all of this happened just as Isaiah had foretold. You know, I can understand why so many people went out to hear John preach. This guy preached the horror and the reality of sin. And yet, what he said made sense. So, for instance, he spoke of how the sacrifices of the temple pointed to the real Savior that God would send. And he spoke about the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. He spoke about the importance of faith for salvation, not the keeping of the law, because John made it clear that keeping the law was not possible. And the sacrifices happening in the temple, they weren't saving you either. If you believed that the sacrifices were there because you were showing God how much you cared and how you would win God's favor by your obedience. And dear people, you get all that just by thinking, by thinking about the main message of John. John's main message is, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent is a word that basically means change your mind. John was calling upon people to think and view sin in a different way. See, they had been taught that sin was nothing more than a simple lack of obedience to the Lord. The only implication that the Jews taught for sin was that if you lived in sin, well, God would make your life hard and difficult. Your life, according to the Jewish religion, was to be one of obedience. And it was also taught that a life of obedience is one that God rewarded with goods and blessings and abundance. Sorry, dear people, but that's how work righteousness works. Be really good and God will bless you. Be a sinner and God will make your life hard. Now, I don't know about all of you, but if I were to measure my own life in this way, I'm going to tell you that I need lots and lots. I need greater and more loving obedience to God in my life. Because if the measure of my spiritual life is my physical blessings, well, at best, all I can say is I'm middle class, which means I'm merely a middle of the road, might be pleasing God kind of soul. And on that basis, dear people, I'm in trouble. But get this. John preaches that everyone is in trouble in direct contradiction to the Jewish religion. 
Everyone is a sinner who needs to repent and needs to turn his attention to the promised Savior. And of course, John's advantage is that he can also proclaim that the Savior is near. In other words, everything the Jewish faith is about is about to come true and to be fulfilled because the Christ of God is at hand. No wonder people flock to John. His message was so different. His message was about God's grace, soon to be realized in the Savior to be revealed. Well, let's you and I take a closer look at some of what Matthew tells us John preached. Of course, there is that base message, repent, change your mind about sin. And please note that that, that phrase is not just about this world. But rather, it's really about the world to come, isn't it? We can see that in the various verses that are found in this text. Listen to what's said. Who warns you to flee from the coming wrath? The axe is ready to strike the root of the trees. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. His winnowing shovel is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor. He will gather his weed into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Clearly, John considers sin to be damnable. Clearly, John understands what was yet to be taught by Jesus. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Clearly, John understands that Jesus is and Jesus will be the ultimate judge of absolutely everything. And I don't know if John got exactly how all of this would happen in Jesus, but by the time it's all said and done, it's clear that John understands already at the baptism of Jesus that Jesus was the Son of God, the fulfiller of God's promises, the Lamb of God, who was going to be the difference in everything. And you can see that truth in contemplating a few of the other statements of John that Matthew shares with us. For instance, therefore, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. What a great truth of God. Again, repentance is that idea of changing your mind. That speaks to us about a changed life. And I try to illustrate this truth in this way. You can't say, I'm sorry, and yet continue in the sin. Another way example it. If I slap you and I say, you, say to you that I'm sorry, but I continue to slap you anyway, is there really sorrow there? And where this becomes harder for us is in the fact that all of us, to one degree or another, are very repetitious in our sins. We say we are sorry, but we keep repeating that sin. I would tell you that to just repeat and to repeat as if it's your right to sin, that, dear people, is close and maybe unbelief. But as we live our lives in Christ, we have a different attitude towards sin. Our sins bother us. They weigh on us. And though we may repeat, there's an agony of soul going on. And eventually, and please note, I speak from experience, Eventually, God will help us overcome and win the victory in Jesus. That is the life of repentance that we lead. Or as I told you before, our life is kind of sin, repent, sin, repent. But with Jesus' help, we get better at that struggle in life. And soon it's sin, repent, sin, repent. And you realize that sin is slowing down our lives because of Jesus. Our lives with Jesus' help, Jesus guides us to hate sin and lead lives of good works to the glory of God the Father. You see, these words help us to grasp that Christianity is never a stagnant kind of thing, thing but rather it's always something that's growing and maturing. Because you and I know very well, a tree that stops growing, that's a tree that stops producing fruit. And a tree that stops producing fruit, you can pretty well bet that that tree's in the process of dying. Here's another statement that clearly John is telling us that the Lamb of God is going to be the difference. John says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But the one who comes after me is mightier than I. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. What wonderful words these are. 
You know, first I want to point out to you that in Scripture, not once does John ever speak of his baptism without saying, I baptize you with water. But did you know the word baptize means to apply water? And then you have to scratch your head and go, well, why would you speak that way? I apply water with water. Because John is telling us that his baptism was nothing more than a water baptism. It was simply a ritual that pointed you toward repentance. But look at what he tells you will happen with the Savior. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That means that Jesus' baptism will be a means of grace. That means by which God offers and gives the forgiveness of sins, eternal life, and salvation. Jesus' baptism carries the power and the wonder of the Holy Spirit. And note what else Jesus' baptism brings. Jesus' baptism brings fire. Now, I suppose we could simply say that that was a reference to the gift of fire at Pentecost, and, and that would be fine. Be a little weak, but that would be fine. You see, in the context with which the word is used here, I think it means something else, and there are two possibilities. Please note that the Holy Spirit is given in Jesus' baptism. Baptism cleanses us from our sins as the Word of God clearly testifies. Remember that fire in that day and age, fire is a cleansing agent. In other words, John is telling us that baptism will result in cleansing, if you would, baptism will result in our being forgiven and our becoming heirs of eternal life. Wow, that's exactly what God's Word says baptism is. Or the other possibility is that the word fire here is simply meant to convey the idea of zealousness, the idea of being on fire for Jesus. In other words, either way, you recognize that the baptism of Jesus is going to be life-changing in every way. How else will things be totally different in Jesus? Well, look at the lesson found in the words here. He will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, dear people, in those words, here's Jesus. Here's Jesus, the ruler and the judge of all. And it's rather clear in these words that eternity, the idea of a heaven and a hell as an eternal destination, is clearly being spoken of. And what will be the difference between heaven and hell? You and me? No. Jesus. In this verse, Jesus is doing all the action. He gathers the wheat. He is the Lord of the harvest. He's the one who has the barn, and on and on and on. All the work is done by Jesus. I don't know if John understood or not that he was already teaching salvation by grace through faith, but that's what's going on here. And if you are going to try and say that the wheat had some sort of role in all of that, what would it be? I, the wheat, plowed? I, the wheat, planted myself. I, the wheat, caused the rain? I, the wheat, commanded the harvesters to come and get me? It gets pretty silly to think in that way, doesn't it? Because you simply realize Jesus is the one who does all the action here. And his actions will simply be dependent on whether or not you have faith, the faith that he gave you in the first place. You will be wheat because of Jesus. But the chaff? The chaff is going to be burned up. But pay attention, because I want you to grasp that the fire is called unquenchable fire. That means it's a never-ending fire, and it's just, it's just not a good picture to think about. And did you catch, as I did, that wonderful play of words that John uses here? Jesus brings the Holy Spirit and fire, that's faith and zeal, but the chaff ends up burned up with unquenchable fire, here is unbelief and judgment. So it is then that John introduces us to the coming of Jesus. That was his job, to tell us Jesus is coming. And eventually, John's message will be, Jesus is here. And I will leave you with the same wonder and hope as John. Prepare. Get ready for the Lord. Keep faith straight. Because Jesus is coming. Amen. Oh, gracious and merciful Father, we 
we do indeed come to you and, and give you thanks for this precious gift of your son, Jesus Christ. But first, dear Lord, we should maybe acknowledge the gift that you gave to us in John the Baptist. What an awesome forerunner he was. Preparing hearts and minds for the Christ to come. Preparing hearts and minds for the Son of God who would live among them and share with them the wonder and marvel of God's holy word. The Christ of God who would eventually die on the cross for all of our sins. And because of his death and resurrection, we are your children and heirs of eternal life. Help us, dear Lord, to prepare, to prepare the way for the Lord. And we prepare simply by believing your holy word. By believing the promises that in the Christ we are saved. By believing that applying simple water to us brings the forgiveness of sins, eternal life, and salvation. By believing that Jesus' resurrection means we have eternal life too. Continue to be our help, our guide, and our strength. Continue to lead us with this wonder and marvel, the joy of salvation that's found in our Savior Jesus. And continue, dear Lord, to throw upon us your Holy Spirit so that through the means of grace we all, might all the more grasp onto and believe in Jesus, Jesus, our only Savior. As always, dear Lord, we come to you on behalf of the sick and ailing of our congregation and indeed on behalf of all of those whom we love. May you be with them and watch over them and use their difficulties and trials to bring them all the closer to you. Help them to grasp, dear Lord, that you move and act in our lives always for our eternal good, for your, your intent is that we should inherit your eternal life and salvation. Be our help, our guide, and our comfort in all things. These things we ask in the name of Jesus, he who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.